Welcome back to our Intermediate Financial Accounting class. In our last couple of segments, we've been talking about taxes, why they're important, how they affect the financial statements, and why they're different between gap and tax law. And we talked about the different focus of each of those rules, accruals for gap, cash flow for taxes, that lead us to different numbers. And then we started talking about what we call deferred taxes, which is the way we reconcile the differences between that gap number and the tax number. Now that we've got, gone through the basics, it's time for us to start looking in more detail at our deferred tax calculations. And to kick us off, I have another example that we can walk through that talks about what causes these differences between tax and gap. Let's take a look. Let's assume that under gap, we show revenues of $1.2 million. We also have expenses under gap of 700,000, which leads us to an income before tax number of $500,000. Our tax rate is 20%. So under gap, we assume that we should owe $100,000 in income tax expense. And that's what we've been doing for most of our time in intermediate accounting, just really basic examples that assume this simple correlation between what we think we should be paying taxes on and what our taxes really are. But then we talk to our tax department and our tax department says, well, your income before taxes is $500,000. That's great. But you have a life insurance benefit that you received for the period. And we don't have to pay taxes on life insurance. So we're going to take that out of there. And they dig a little deeper and they say, you know, you've got some unearned rent revenue. It's unearned for gap, but we've got the money. So we have to pay taxes on that amount. So we're going to add that back in. And then they take a look at our depreciation, which we've talked about a little bit already. And they said, you showed straight line depreciation and that's great. But under makers, we get to take a much bigger deduction for depreciation. So we're going to take out $300,000 above and beyond what you've already got in there as depreciation expense you don't have to pay taxes on that this year. And finally, as one last example, let's assume that there's a warranty expense and under GAP we recognize this warranty expense, but we haven't actually paid for it yet. And because we haven't actually paid for it, the government says you can't take that as a tax break now. So I'm sorry, we have to add that back in. And that's what our tax department is doing. These are what we call our tax adjustments that allow us to calculate our taxable income as we convert from income before taxes to our taxable income number. So I add all that up. I take the 500,000 of gap. I reconcile all these differences and I end up saying that, you know, even though you think you should pay taxes on 500,000, the reality is you only have to pay taxes on 212,000. So at 20%, you only owe 42,400. So we have a difference between income tax expense up here at 100,000 and income tax payable down here at 42,400. Is that a deferred tax asset or a deferred tax liability? Well, the easiest way to think about this is to look at the difference between gap and tax. Income tax expense under gap is 100,000. And our taxes payable for tax purposes is only 42,400. So it's higher than my gap number is. If I'm paying less than I think I should have to, then that's a deferred tax liability because I'm gonna pay less than I think I should this year, which is gonna come back and make me pay more in the future. And that's how I decide deferred tax asset versus liability. If the taxes were lower, I was paying more than I thought I should have to under gap, then I'd have a deferred tax asset because I'm paying more. So just looking at where taxes are versus gap. If I go up, it's a liability because I'm going to pay less now, more later. If I go down, I'm paying more now, so I'll pay less later. That's an asset. Now, before we continue on talking about methods and steps, there is one more discussion that we need to have, and that's the difference between temporary and permanent differences. 
A temporary difference is what we've been talking about. It's a difference in the recognition timing between gap and tax rules. So I say that I have a million dollar machine under straight line depreciation. I'm going to amortize that away $100,000 a year for 10 years. Under tax rules, I use the maker's tables. So I do 500,000 in the first year, 300,000 in the second year, 200,000 in the third year, and then zero for the rest of the 10 years. The totals are the same. Under gap, I recognize a million dollars of depreciation, just takes 10 years to do it. Under tax, I recognize a million dollars of depreciation, but it only takes three years. That's a timing difference. The amounts are the same, but the timing is different. When the difference is temporary, it's caused by timing, I see a deferred tax asset or liability because of the timing difference. Like in the example we just talked about, I'll have to pay extra taxes in the future to make up for the tax breaks I'm getting now. Because one way or another, I'm only going to get a million dollars worth of depreciation expense to offset my income. There are other differences, however, that aren't a difference in timing. Instead, the difference is in the recognition amounts. So the rules actually require me to report more or less income under tax law than they do under U.S. GAAP. For example, I don't have to pay taxes on life insurance benefits. So if I pass away, my wife will get all of the insurance money and she wanted to pay taxes on it. But that difference is never going to reconcile. I get a million dollars in income because of this life insurance benefit. I will never pay taxes on it. So I'm going to show the revenue for gap and I will never show any revenue for tax. That doesn't cause a deferred tax asset or liability because the difference is permanent. And because it will never reconcile, there's no future liability where someday I'm going to have to pay on that million dollars in taxes. Those permanent differences don't go into our deferred tax calculations at all. We simply take them out of the equation and ignore them, which is kind of nice for us from a financial perspective because I don't have to fuss with it a great deal. I can just take them out and be done with it. Other examples of permanent differences are fines and penalties. If I get charged a fine by the federal government, I don't get to take that as a tax break, but I do have to show it as an expense. So my gap income is going to be lower, but I will never get a tax break for that amount. Interest from municipal bonds is another permanent tax difference. I never have to pay taxes, at least under U.S. federal tax rules, on interest that I make on municipal bonds. So my gap number will be higher. I will never have to pay taxes on that. Another example, going back to our life insurance, I can't get a discount for the premiums that I pay. So I don't have to pay taxes on the benefit that I get, but I don't get to take a deduction for the premiums. Well, now that we've talked about deferred taxes, it's time to jump into the actual method of calculating income tax expense and doing, yes, the journal entry for taxes. So let's take a look at some steps that'll walk us through this process. First off, we start by calculating income before taxes. Then we go to our tax department and we get some information from them. And we subtract or add, depending on the direction, the permanent differences from our income before taxes. And that's going to give us what we call our book taxable income. This is the amount we think we should have to pay taxes on for gap purposes, because I've taken out the permanent differences. Step three, I'm going to subtract out the temporary difference. Some of these lead to deferred tax assets. Some of them lead to deferred tax liabilities. These are the timing effects. And I'm going to subtract those from that book taxable income to get me to taxable income. So step two is the number that I think I should have to pay taxes on for gap. Step three is what I'm actually going to pay taxes on under the tax law. I then multiply that taxable income from step three by my average enacted tax rate. And that gives me either income tax payable if I owe the government money, or it can give me a receivable if I've got a loss and the government owes me a refund from previous years. Step five is to calculate my net deferred taxes. This is the amount that I think I'm going to have to pay or that I think I will save in the future because of the tax break I'm getting this year. To do that, I figure out when each of these temporary differences from step three will reconcile. And I create a table that allows me to compare gap versus tax 
in every year until the reconciliation is complete. Think of our previous example of depreciation expense of a million dollars. I would have the current year, and then I would have nine future years that I would be looking at for my different taxes. And I would compare the gap number to the tax number each of those future nine years. I then calculate the difference between tax and gap multiplied by the enacted tax rate for that particular year, all the way from years two through 10. And then I add up all of those tax amounts to get my net deferred taxes. I do that for every single one of the differences I use in step three, and I add them all up to get one big number. And that one big number is going to be the desired ending balance in my deferred tax account. Could be a liability, could be an asset, depending on how those temporary differences reconcile. Once I know the desired ending balance from step five, then in step six, I figure out the journal entry amount to get from my current deferred tax balance to the desired balance. And then I can make my journal entry. I'll have every piece I need at that point. Now this list can look really intimidating, but let me show you how it works in our example, and maybe it will help you feel a little bit more comfortable with what we're doing. So you remember, we had these differences between US GAAP and IRS income. And these differences walk us right through our steps. So step one is figuring out income before taxes. Step two is taking out the permanent differences. And there's only one in this list. That's that life insurance. Step three is going to be to take out the unearned rent revenue, the extra depreciation, the warranty, et cetera, to get to that taxable income. Step four down here is our income taxes payable. So those are our first four steps. Step five is over here, figuring out the deferred tax asset and liability. And from there, is just plugging and chugging into my journal entry. So although it looks intimidating, with enough practice and walking through some simple examples, you'll feel comfortable with this as well. And that's where we're going to head in our next segment, is actually doing some examples of deferred taxes. And finally, we're going to get a chance to do a journal entry. I'm so excited. We'll see you then. Thanks.